Hey guys, this is John, and today I'm reviewing Opening Repertoire, Nimzo and Bogo Indian by International Master Christoph Selecki. So Christoph is an International Master from Germany, and he is Chess Explained here on YouTube. If you haven't seen his videos, I don't know what to tell you. You've probably been living under a rock for the past few years. <laughs> uh, but in all seriousness, he's one of the most prominent YouTubers out there, and he does a great job on his channel. Uh, and he has talked about for a while about this book that he's been writing, and it was finally released over the summer uh, in July of this year. And he was nice enough to send me a copy. Uh, you guys know from the book reviews I've done in the past, um, I have friends in the chess world who write stuff and are cool enough to send me their book, and I get to review it for my channel. So um, I'll tell you right away, I really like this book. I'm not going to hide that. <laughs> this is an excellent work. And I'm going to give you some reasons why I think it's such a great book. Um, I'm not really surprised because Christoph, just based on his videos and all the analytical work I've seen him do, uh, is an excellent theoretician. And he has a good grasp of what uh, comprises a good opening repertoire, I think, too. He's an excellent player in the opening, and he really knows his stuff. And that shows in the book. And not only does he know his stuff, but he knows how to elucidate that, and he knows how to communicate his knowledge to his audience. So nice looking book published by Everyman Chess. It's 440 pages, and this is basically a black repertoire against D4, um, composed of the Nimzo and Bogo Indian, as the book title suggests. So let's take a look at the table of contents. This is just pulled from the Everyman website, and we'll go down to the contents here. So the first 300 pages in this book deal with the Nimzo Indian. And you can see there's a rundown of all of the minor and major lines within the Nimzo Indian. So he spends the majority of the book on that, which makes sense. You could consider uh, the Nimzo Indian basically the premier defense to D4. I don't think you're going to find many people who would um, disagree with that, that the Nimzo Indian is like the main battleground within the Queen's Pawn openings. You know, can white uh, pursue an advantage? In that line or is black equalizing? Uh, theory and practice seems to suggest that black is equalizing or very close to it and the Nimzo is such a reliable defense uh, and Christoph does a good job of explaining why. Uh, the remainder of the book is on the Bogo Indian which is reached after move three, knight f3, bishop b4 check for black and there's a very small, small section on the Catalan Bogo which is this move g3 that's the Catalan by white and that's interesting because the Catalan is a major opening. And in fact, about 10 years ago, following the publication of Boris Avruk's book for quality chess, the Catalan just absolutely exploded in popularity. But um, you notice that in Christoph's book, uh, the coverage of the Catalan is relatively minor. And that's for good reason. Uh, he says you basically get a two for one deal by playing Bishop b4 check against the Catalan move order g3. And in doing so, you have a very good chance of just transposing to the lines he covers in the previous couple chapters in the Bogo Indian. So that's already a nice uh, time-saving thing. And I got to be honest, I was kind of skeptical of an author's ability to write a comprehensive opening book uh, around the, the Nimzo complex because it is such a massive project to tackle. There's so many lines you have to consider. And you can see right here, just white's move four alternatives, a3, f3, e3, uh, queen c2, uh, the classical variation. Just that alone is just a massive undertaking trying to develop a repertoire around that. Uh, moreover, the positions that arise in the Nimzo and Bogo, and just the Nimzo complex are kind of hard to analyze sometimes. And he talks about this the analytical work he had to undertake to uh, provide a useful repertoire. Um, and in fact, I can tell you in my own lessons and with my own students, I've often shied away from recommending the Nimzo complex just because it is such a daunting thing for most players uh, to dive into, despite its theoretical reputation. Uh, so uh, nice variation index and complete game index, uh, very well-sourced bibliography. Uh, all the particulars of the, the book itself are excellent. So going into the intro here, I wanted to draw attention to um, this cohesive repertoire concept that Christoph discusses throughout the book. And you can kind of read that right here. He talks about how previous works on the Nimzo have all advocated um, a so-called light squared approach, um, which he says, what is a light squared approach? Well, this means uh, playing either b6 to Fienkedo the 
black queenside bishop or occupying the center with d5. And he discusses how it struck him to instead advocate a dark square approach, which is what you kind of see in this diagram here, involving trading the Nimzo bishop on c3, as often happens, and then trying to establish pawns on dark squares. And this is a position from uh, the Hobner variation, which he advocates, where black has established three pawns on dark squares, c5, d6, e5, and in doing so really shores up that weak color complex. He makes up for the fact that he has no dark square bishop anymore. Um, and this is a very strategically rich situation, and you'll find many, many interesting games in this book that are analyzed with this type of structure. Um, and also, this is a diagram from the Bogo Indian section of the book. You can see the same type of thing. So the repertoire he proposes in the Bogo, uh, Black achieves a similar pawn structure, going d6 and then e5. That's kind of the, the defining pawn structure. Um, he doesn't manage to... Uh, get every single line in the book to fit this style of pawn structure. And that would be impossible anyways, so you can't really blame him for that. But this is kind of like the, uh, the strategic roadmap that he likes to follow. And I love that approach because for someone just reading this book, even me as an IM, that made it very easy to follow. Like at all times, we kind of knew that this was the default pawn structure that we were looking to aim for. And he does a brilliant job of explaining uh, the theory and the strategic concepts behind this pawn structure. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to give you a rundown of the repertoire that Christoph proposes and just try to familiarize you with the lines. Uh, Christoph actually did a, a little video uh, on his book where he discusses the move orders and stuff in more depth, but I, I kind of wanted to describe how um, he presents this dark square theme. I think it's done rather nicely, nicely and seamlessly. So let's start with the Nimzo. So d4, knight f6, c4, e6. Now here white has three moves, uh, knight c3, which we're going to look at here, knight f3, and g3. So starting with knight c3, and now bishop b4, the Nimzo Indian. And black essentially um, does not occupy the center with pawns yet, but looks to influence the center with his pieces. So in playing bishop b4, Black holds up e4, that move would just lose a pawn now because of knight takes e4, and introduces a strategic threat of taking and doubling up white's pawns. So within the Nimzo, uh, the two most popular replies at this juncture are e3, so just pushing a pawn, reinforcing the center, opening light square bishop, and queen c2. And in uh, Christoph's video that he did on this book, he says that e3 and queen c2 are played roughly 30% of the time each. So e3 gets played 30% of the time, queen c2 gets played 30% of the time. So that's already uh, half of the available games after bishop b4 uh, follow one of those moves. And then you have lots of other stuff too, which we, we're going to look at a couple of them. Uh, moves like a3 and also f3. So after e3, Christoph proposes castling for black, and then following bishop d3, which is a standard developing move, playing c5. So already black is establishing a pawn on a dark square. And... Here one line goes uh, knight g2, but let's say white plays knight f3, which is another major line. Then black can play knight c6, white castles, and now the voluntary trade of the dark square bishop for the knight on c3. So bishop takes c3, b takes c3, and now d6. And this leads to that first diagram that we looked at when we were examining the table of contents. So black is playing d6, getting ready for e5. And black is trying to establish those pawns on dark squares to make up for the fact that he has no dark square bishop. And as you may have guessed, many of the positions that uh, black hopes to achieve are of the closed and semi-closed variety. Okay, that's, that's a fixture of this repertoire, especially in the Nimzo section. Closed and semi-closed positions, because if you're going to give up the bishop pair like this, uh, it kind of follows that black is not going to be opening the position too quickly, unless he's certain that it's safe. So good illustration of the dark square theme here. And in fact, at the end of this video, I'm going to show you a game of Kristoff's where um, he used this pawn structure very nicely. So that's the proposed line against e3, very common move, uh, playing castles, and then c5 and going for this so-called Hobner variation named after uh, Robert Hobner, uh, a fellow uh, German player, actually countryman of Kristoff's, who was very, very strong. Um, I believe back in the 1970s was kind of his era. So let's move on. Let's take a look at the classical variation. 
So once again, we have d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, and bishop b4. So in the classical variation, white plays queen c2. This is the line that I generally prefer against the Nemzo Indian. And one just litmus test you can use when you're trying to gauge an opening book's worth to you is uh, look up the line that you play in that opening or that you play against that opening, if applicable. So the very first thing I did when I got Christoph's book is uh, look up this line. And uh, unfortunately for me, I found uh, some antidotes to variations that I thought were problematic for black. Uh, but based on Christoph's analysis, I <laughs> have had to make a couple adjustments. Uh, so I've mentioned this before in my book reviews, but if I can pick up a book and I see something like immediately useful to me, I can just scroll to the or flip to the relevant chapter and I see something that might help me in my next game I play at IM or GM level. Um, already I'm thinking that's a valuable book. Uh, and since Queen C2 is my main weapon uh, and I saw the variation that Christoph was proposing, and what I felt about that variation uh, turned out to be a little wrong. That's already something I can learn from. So after queen c2, black has several different moves they can try. They can try castles, they can try d5, they can try c5. But Kristoff makes a great case for knight c6. This is the so-called Zurich variation. So knight c6 immediately pressuring the pawn on d4 and pretty much forcing white to respond with knight f3. And now black can play d6. And already you can see black building this dark square pawn chain that we've come to know. So d6 with the idea of e5 very soon, uh, sometimes with queen e7 and then e5. And this bishop on b4 inevitably will be traded for the knight. Unlike the previous line with e3, uh, black will be trading and presumably white will be recapturing with a piece, queen takes c3 or possibly uh, a bishop on d2 taking on c3. So white will avoid double pawns, but nonetheless, black will still be able to set up their desired pawn structure with this pawn coming to e5. So that's his recommendation against the queen c2 variation, the Zurich variation. Let's take a look at another line. So next we're going to look at the Samish variation, which is d4, knight f6, c4, e6 once again, knight c3, bishop b4, and now a3. So you could consider the Samish variation to be uh, kind of the critical test of the Nimzo, or at least it was thought to be for a very long time. So white just playing a3 and forcing black to take on c3, really. Um, you would think that this falls directly in lines with white's uh, or with black's plans, but uh, in fact, this variation is pretty rich and black really has to know what they're doing. And I recall Kristoff even saying that, that he used to think this line was just bad for white, but in the process of writing this book, he actually had to revise some conclusions. So after bishop takes c3 check, b takes c3, he proposes this move c5. And for instance, if the game goes f3, whereupon white prepares e4, white will often do this in this line looking to build a big center. You can see the pattern of development emerge in a, in a similar way to um, earlier lines. So black putting a pawn on c5, reinforcing it, with d6, b6, so even throwing in an early b6 here, that's just so white doesn't win a pawn by taking twice on c5. Bishop d3, knight a5, looking to pressure here. Black can kind of get away with moves like this because the position is already fairly closed. Uh, not that white can't strive to open it up, uh, but if black plays carefully enough, the position should remain closed for the time being. And then knight h3 and now e5. So this is just one line that I sampled from this chapter that he uh, gives as a main variation. So already by, this is move 10, black has established all of these pawns on dark squares. Again, making up for the dark square bishop's absence. One other line. We're actually moving to the Bogo Indian now. So white can play knight f3 on move 3, which a lot of players do because the Nimzo has such a good reputation for black, knight c3, bishop b4 that many white players just decide, you know what, I don't want to allow that pin, so I'll just play knight f3, just bring out a knight. It's a good developing move. It kind of rules out certain systems, like there is an argument for playing d5 now and going into a queen's gambit decline based on the fact that the knight has already been committed here. But Christoph recommends bishop b4 check, the super solid nim, uh, bogo Indian. And if white were to play knight c3, that would kind of defeat the purpose of his move order. White can play knight c3 here. Uh, but the two main moves that 
are covered are bishop d2 and knight bd2. And of the two, Kristoff considers knight bd2 to be more critical, which is interesting because I was curious and looked in the database and bishop d2 is played more often. And it, it's the move that I've seen kind of given in various works. Um, so it's interesting that nowadays knight bd2 is supposed to be the more challenging move. I have to say I'm not an expert on these positions as white, even though I play d4 from the white side. I generally do not play knight f3 on move three. I usually play knight c3. Uh, but some of the analysis in this uh, book may actually encourage me to, to change that a little bit. So after knight bd2, um, interestingly here, and this is one perk about this book, at various times, Kristoff gives multiple approaches you can use in a position. So in this position right here, he discusses two lines that you can play. So one is castles, which he considers to be the best line, but it actually leads to a pretty sharp position. Uh, that line being castles, a3. And now supposedly it's best for black to retreat the bishop to e7, because if they take, they haven't been able to derive any structural benefit from this capture. And unlike a Nimzo position, um, where retreating the, the bishop back to e7 is pretty rare. Here, white, white's uh, not necessarily gaining a whole lot by having the knight on d2. But the line runs bishop e7, e4, d5, e5, knight fd7. And this produces a pretty volatile position in the center. As I said, like not every line in the book follows this dark square theme. Uh, Christoph gives extensive coverage to this position and the resulting complications. Um, but what's really nice is the fact that he doesn't just give castles and say, well, you know, this breaks with our repertoire, uh, but I think it's the best, so just trust me. No, he actually gives d6 too, and he analyzes this in depth and basically gives it to you as a viable weapon, uh, with d6 being kind of similar. The plan here is, let's say after a3, just to trade the bishop for the knight. So white has the bishop pair now, but black will still try, try to set up a pawn chain like we've uh, been used to. So going this time knight bd7 and playing for e5. So another dark square oriented plan. And as I'll discuss in a little bit, I just love that when opening books like give you multiple approaches to a position, they don't just take the lazy way out and say, uh, I'm advocating this and I'm not going to give any reason why. Just trust me that it's the line you should play. Uh, he actually wants this to be a playable repertoire for the person who buys the book. And in doing that, he accommodates for people's tastes, like maybe maybe castles, a3, bishop, e7, followed by d5 is too sharp for you. Maybe you just want a playable position, uh, so you can play d6. So that kind of comprises the um, Bogo Indian uh, part of the book. I should mention bishop, d2, the move that he thinks is less critical, but it's played a lot. So here, black can play a couple different things, like queen, e7 is very popular. Bishop takes d2 check is solid, albeit a little uninspiring. He likes a5 in this position, with one plausible line being g3, and then this familiar dark square theme, d6, bishop g2, knight bd7, castles, and then e5. This is one of the um, base positions for the theory he discusses. And now, just very quickly before I go on, uh, the Catalan Bogo. So d4, knight f6, and this time, on move three, white opting for g3. Like I said, the Catalan uh, has pretty much blown up in popularity, I would say, in the past 10 years since the publication of that Avruk book. But playing bishop b4 check really cuts down on the amount that you have to learn. There are alternatives for black here, of course, d5 or c5. But uh, bishop b4 check is a nice way to try to force Bogo Indian positions, and thereby kill two birds with one stone. So. White has a similar choice as in the BOGO, like how to block the check. So if bishop d2, he again recommends a5. And quoting Kristoff, he says, this approach is just as good as in the regular BOGO move order. About 90% of the time, it will just transpose to what we have already exam examined. But sometimes White tries to reach independent positions. And he spends the roughly, I think it's about 15 pages discussing like how the game can proceed independently. Um, if knight d2 here, instead of bishop d2, he recommends c5, so striking at white center. So that's a rundown of the lines in the book. I know I didn't cover every single line, but uh, that's kind of the main ones. And let's take a look at one nice example of discussion of plans in the book. So I'm going to upload one of the games that Christoph gives. It's one of his games, actually. And 
it's a game he played against this player Vander Stript in 2014. So it's within the e3 variation, and Kristoff is able to get a Hubner. So bishop d3, c5, knight f3, knight c6. I find these Hubner positions very enjoyable to study because it's kind of like a classic battle of like the bishop pair plus worse pawn structure uh, versus sound pawn structure, no bishop pair. So it, re it produces uh, rich positions and ones that are pretty interesting to study. And in this game, uh, Kristoff's opponent played knight d2, and now pawn e5. So right here, I'm just going to open up the book and kind of read to you a little bit um, of something I thought was, was interesting at this point. So after e5, Kristoff spends about two pages like discussing in detail the various plans that are available for white. So, and he uh, gives four plans, plans A, B, C, and D, and gives about a paragraph each discussing like what white should be, what, what, what white will be trying to do and what the play will look like. And roughly summarized, um, the four plans available for white are close the center, so play D5, and then play F4. Um, play F4 immediately, so without touching the D pawn. Close the center, so play d5, and then after knight e7, immediately follow up with e4. And the final plan is play e4, uh, knight e4 for white, and try to exploit the central squares with peace play. So the fact that he like paused within the theory discussion and, and talked about like four different plans right here, I thought was really interesting. Uh, and then what's more, he goes on to talk about like what black should be doing. And since this position is relatively non-forcing, he actually kind of talks about like what each piece should be doing and the functions that they should be uh, trying to undertake. So just to give you an example, let me see if I can find something. Uh, he says, a move to entirely avoid for black is queen e7, which takes away the e7 square from the c6 knight in the case of d5. Black always wants to place his knight on e7, closer to the king side where the action is about to take place. It is wrong to put it on a5 in nearly all cases as there is no chance ever to win the c-pawn. So already that provides like a useful roadmap. Uh, you never want to put the queen here because the knight, the natural square for the knight is taken away. And unlike some positions you may have seen in the Nimzo, you don't really have a chance to win the c-pawn, so you don't want to put the knight on a5. Um, he goes on here, so again, quoting Kristoff on page 203. He says, this leads us to the bishop. It almost invariably should stay on the c8 h3 diagonal and not go to a6, especially if the center is closed or white has that option. The reason is similar to the argument against knight a5. c4 is no target for the moment. There are more pressing matters on the king side. So you won't be playing something like this and trying to assault that pawn. Um, you'll just be developing the bishop a little more conventionally and possibly using it for a king side defense. So I, I just consistently found like throughout this book that he goes the extra mile in describing the plans. And um, as an excellent theoretician, he he understands when positions are closed and um, sort of of the maneuvering persuasion where you can get away with like discussions of this and then where discussions of um, like peace play and where you want to arrange your forces is actually preferable than just discussing all the theory. Because uh, it would be a wrong approach to like try to break a position like this down simply by the theory and completely ignore the plans. So I thought that was a, a good illustration of, of the type of approach he takes throughout the book. So theory when appropriate, but also heavy discussion of plans too. So you really get to understand this opening. Um, one other thing, let me upload a game between Nakamura and Carlson, which features in one of the lines that Christoph recommends. So this is from the Nimzo part of the repertoire again, and this time it's the F3 variation which you may know that uh, Anand played against Carlsen in a must-win situation in the World Championship. So after f3, Kristoff advocates c5, d5, castles. And now after e4, we reach a position where, once again, he proposes a couple different lines. So this is from page 70 in the book. So he gives two moves here. Um, Carlsen in this position played d6 against Nakamura. But uh, he also gives ample coverage to b5, which is uh, a pretty interesting move to try to undermine the c4 pawn. And quoting him, he says, b5, as suggested in the previous game, might be too wild for some re readers, 
So I decided to include this less forcing but still interesting alternative, talking about d6. It usually leads to a Nimzo Benoni structure, but if white allows it, black still has the Blumenfeld style b5 up his sleeve. So once again, he's kind of catering to um, the wide tastes that the audience might have. And this is one thing about uh, this Nimzo complex is you can find very sharp lines and you can find very strategic positional lines. There's a little bit of everything in there. Um, let me show you another example where he discusses a couple different alternatives. So going back to the classical variation now, d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop b4, and queen c2. So he also talks about like why he discarded certain variations. So that's that's pretty interesting. Um, it's always nice to hear like an author's rationale for why they didn't uh, adopt certain lines or what they didn't like about them. So here, as we already know, he likes knight c6. But he also gives like a good rundown of why he rejected like castles, why he didn't like d5 and c5. Not that any of these lines are bad, but he just felt like knight c6 would lead to the type of positions that we most desire out of this. Uh, so even though castles is like the main move, arguably the most flexible, it didn't fit with the repertoire. And he didn't want to just ignore that fact. He actually wanted to uh, discuss like why it didn't fit and his justification for knight c6. Trying to find that relevant portion in the book. I seem to not have marked it. Ah, here we go. So just to kind of give an overview of this, he says the current main line for black at the top level is castles, a3, bishop takes c3, queen takes c3, and then d5. He says this enjoys a good reputation at the moment, but I discarded it for the presented repertoire due to various reasons. One, it's a light squared setup, so it does not fit well with our other choices. Uh, two, the need, the need to learn many forced lines. Three, some lines lead to a forced draw, which is a practical problem. And four, it has been covered recently in the Nimzo Indian Move by Move, which I believe is another book by Everyman Chess. He says, don't get me wrong, this is a good line, but it just does not fit the bill. And then going back a little bit here, he also says, there is c5, but this does not lead to a closed dark square center either. After d takes c5, so that's an important distinction, the fact that white can capture rather than having to push past, you will reach positions that are more likely to resemble a hedgehog or an English opening, where the c and d pawns are often exchanged. And he goes on, he kind of describes why b6 didn't fit the repertoire. Um, yeah, he said, ultimately, there are only two lines that fit the dark squared approach. Black can aim for a setup with d6 and knight bd7, or he can go for the Zurich variation which is what he eventually decided on. He says, in the end, I decided to go for the Zurich variation. The main reason is that black will invariably reach his desired structures of d6 and e5, and with his dark square bishop traded off or outside the pawn chain. So, so those were the three main things that really caught my eye about this book and what I enjoyed. The fact that one, it's a cohesive repertoire, and it's a full repertoire within d4 main lines based on this dark square approach. Uh, two, his excellent discussion of plans. It's a great theoretical work, but any book can be written on theory. Uh, you could virtually have a computer write a book on theory these days, but the discussion of plans is what really sets opening books apart from one another. And three, the discussion of alternatives and why he uh, rejected or accepted certain lines. That's how you know an author like really did their research, is when they considered and maybe even poured some blood, sweat, and tears into analyzing other lines and then eventually rejected them. Like to me, that shows the author really went out of his way to do a good job. So those are the three main things I enjoyed about Christoph's book. Uh, so overall, overall I, I highly recommend this work. Um, I'm going to put up a link to Christoph's channel. I think he's actually um, selling some of these books on his own. I don't know if he's still doing that, but I'll put a link in case you want that, like personalized copies. Um, now, just for fun, since we all like Christoph and he has played a lot of these lines himself, I went digging through his uh, YouTube archive and I found a game in uh, one of the lines he recommends that I thought was kind of interesting and kind of personifies the approach that he recommends. So this is a game he played back in 2013 on ICC against Anonymous Grandmaster Desireless. And here's how the game went. 
I believe Christoph was in the early stages of writing the book at this time. So it was a sameish variation with a3, bishop takes c3 check. Now c5, so black already sets up a blockade. I'm not going to analyze this game too thoroughly. It was a blitz game after all. It would be kind of unfair for me to like criticize play for either white or black too, too closely. So castles, knight f3, d6, white castles, and now e5. So already we've got that characteristic structure. And I just found the way that Kristoff handled this resulting position to be so nice and straightforward that uh, I couldn't resist sharing it with you guys. So here the Grandmaster played queen c2. And this is all theory. I looked this position up in the database. It looks like black mostly plays rook e8 or queen e7 right here um, in order to threaten e4. Interestingly, I guess queen e7 would kind of violate the rule about putting the queen on the, the square where the knight wants to go to. So Kristoff instead played h6. So putting another pawn on a dark square, making sure bishop takes h7 is never an issue. The GM played d5. Black played knight e7 e4, and now Kristoff retreated the knight to e8. So this prepares f5, which is kind of a theme in these structures. Uh, often there'll be a race for black to play f5, or white to try to move their knight and play f4. So here the GM played knight h4. Now black played knight g6. So offering to trade and thereby double the pawns, but obtain the open f-file. I think actually white should have done that. So done this and played f4. Uh, but maybe they didn't like the resulting position. Uh, oh, by the way, there was also the, the tactical possibility of knight takes d5 here, I believe. And if white takes it back, queen takes h4 can be played. But uh, knight g6 was played, and white responded with knight f5. And here Kristoff played the interesting move knight f4, so jumping in and encouraging white to trade off uh, his bishop. Moreover, after g3, he went ahead and took white's light square bishop. So this is a bad piece, but eliminating the bishop pair uh, does kind of reduce the danger to black's position, I believe, in the long run. And black still has that structural advantage to look forward to. And here, he followed up with bishop takes f5, so getting rid of that dangerous knight. e takes f5, knight f6. Now white played perhaps, uh, well, I don't know if it's fair to call this a dubious move, but this move kind of gets him in trouble soon. f3. Black played rook e8. Rook e1, queen d7, connecting the rooks. Maybe this queen will make an appearance on a4. That would be a very nice square for it where it could attack c4. Maybe a plan is like queen a4, knight d7, knight b6, and go after that pawn. So hence, white plays a4. But after rook e7, g4, Kristoff now broke the center open with e4. Excellent move. And following f takes e4, he could play knight takes g4 and regain the pawn but he wants to win that e-pawn and play down the, the newly opened e-file. So he plays rook a8, the grandmaster played e5, rook takes e5, rook takes e5, get a trade going, h3, and now queen e7. So there's been some simplifications, but you can see that black's pawns are still on dark squares. Uh, he has a very compact position. There's not many weaknesses white can grab onto. Perhaps d6 is slightly weak, but white's not in a good position to exploit that. And white, to me, looks a bit overextended. So white played bishop f4, finally completing his development. And Kristoff decided to uh, provoke further simplification. So he traded on e1. Queen f1, offering a trade. And he decided to take and go for the endgame. Followed by knight e8. So if you were to quickly glance at this position, uh, it's hard to believe that black would be the one playing for the win. But I believe that is the case despite the fact that white has way more space than black, and it's a bishop versus knight with pawns on both sides of the board, uh, the structure is so solid for black and the position is so closed, you should definitely prefer the knight in the long run, unless white were able to open the position somehow. And following h4, he played f6. So again, notice all the pawns on dark squares that black has established. And after king e2, king f7, the plan is to put the king on e7 and then start maneuvering this knight. And in the, in the video where Kristoff played this, he talked about this knight, this uh, route he had in mind for the knight. c7, a8, b6, going after these pawns. It makes perfect sense. So here, I think white was kind of oblivious to that idea. He took a step in the wrong direction, king f3. I believe he had to play king d3, trying to prepare his king to come over. 
Even then, black would have some winning chances, I think. But after king f3, king e7, king e4, Kristoff played a5, excellent move. This fixes the pawn on a4, so it can never hope to come up to a5. And now it's just a sitting duck pawn. White played g5. Black responded with h5, keeping the position as closed as possible. King f3. Again, this king is heading in the wrong direction. And knight c7. Bishop c1, knight a8. And it transpires that white's going to lose something. Knight b6, and he cannot save that a pawn. King d3, knight takes a4. King c2, the knight came back. And throughout this whole maneuver, black never had to expose himself or really even take many risks. Here he took on c4, king takes, knight check, and goes and takes the d5 pawn. And there were a couple minor technical obstacles, but black did win this in nice style. Here he came up with the great move d5, so temporarily giving a pawn back, but after takes, he frees up the d6 square. Goes and takes d5. I think here, white's only chance to maybe hold was king e7, trying to take on f6 with the king. But white takes with the bishop, and after knight takes f5, he's lost. White can't defend the h-pawn, and now he's down two pawns. And this h-pawn is just going to go run and get a touchdown. Black won. So I liked how effortless this seemed, and this was a blitz game, remember, so just five minutes per side. But uh, it kind of personifies this dark square approach and Kristoff's level of understanding and comfort in these type of lines. So always cool to see an author like playing the same lines that they advocate and having it work out well for them. Uh, so once again, I give this book my full blessing. Uh, I hope if you are looking for something against D4 that you might consider this because um, I know I will. I'm definitely thinking about uh, incorporating a few of these lines, probably not into my tournament repertoire because that would be a big overhaul, but definitely into uh, some games I play online. So I'll put up a link to Christoph's channel if you want to go check out his stuff. And thank you guys for watching. Let me know if you had any feedback. All right, talk to you guys later. Bye.